Hi everyone and welcome to the Confronting Extinction live panel discussion. Today we have about 11,000 school children with us and many more participants watching from home and we have people from many many different countries and it's so wonderful to have you all with us here today. Um, I'm Bella Lack and I'm a 17 year old conservationist and environmental activist and Behind me, the image that I've chosen today is of a mother and an elephant calf. And I chose this because it, during this live, we're going to speak a lot about the impact of the illegal wildlife trade on populations of species. And we're going to speak about the impact on humans. But I think it's important that we remember the impact on individuals as well. And from the photo, you can see how beautiful and intimate the bond is between a mother, babe, and baby elephant. And um, elephants are incredibly intelligent creatures and you can only imagine the despair they feel when the herd is impacted by the illegal wildlife trade. So we're going to get a bit more into that. Um, and I think you all agree with me that elephants and all the species that we share this planet with should be able to live in peace without human exploitation. And today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Earth Day was created in 1969 to honor our planet and also to honor the concept of peace. So today as the 50th anniversary, it's really important that we feel gratitude for the beautiful planet we have and also think about ways that we can protect the planet and stop waging war on nature and other species. So first of all I'm going to introduce our panelists and we're going to begin with filmmaker and director Kate Brooks. Uh, I am the director of Last Animals Film and that's what I thought. My name is Kate Brooks. I'm a war photographer. Billions of dollars in wildlife products are being funneled through secret networks, forces at play that have led to the near annihilation of elephants and the extinction of rhinos in the heart of Africa. I'm now using my camera to document the consequences Sorry, of the Sorry, I forgot to introduce the trailer. ...and capture the last of the species. For the northern white rhino, right now, the future is so sad. When we lose her and we lose the other three, we've lost an entire species of rhino. When Kate speaking is a video just on Kate. Some of these syndicates have links to human trafficking, gun smuggling, and narcotics. <laughs> Jessica? You can't keep moving this much ivory. It's corruption. We can potentially crush the largest part of the ivory trade. It's time. Extinction happens in front of our eyes. We have the last of their kind, and they will just die off in front of us. I do not think that any of us would stand and watch an elephant or rhino being killed, or a ranger being gunned down because we wanted a bracelet or an ornament to impress someone else as a gift. But that is what the demand for wildlife products means in practice. Over a thousand rangers have been killed in the last 10 years. The face of extinction just comes right at you. Wildlife trafficking has become more dangerous than ever before. If we don't stop the killing, it will eventually just be as humans as the last animals. I'm the director of the Last Animals film, the trailer of which you just watched, and a photographer. I am also the executive director of the Last Animals Foundation that was set up after the making of this film. Thanks, Kate. And our next panelist is Dr. Thomas Hillbrandt. Yeah, hi, my name is Thomas. Uh, I'm working in the field of wildlife research for 30 years. I'm based in Berlin at the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research. Uh, I start my work with elephants. Uh, you will see here uh, in a picture I brought here uh, that, uh, that we work quite closely to these uh, magnificent species, to 
actually to understand how they can reproduce uh, in a best and successful way so that we have for zoos, for example, not to import more elephants from the wild. Uh, we also uh, work quite intensively with two uh, females that actually is the last uh, two rhinos from a very specific species. That's a northern white rhino. You will see that in the movie from Kate. Um, and we try to uh, propagate, uh, to make babies uh, and so that this species don't lose our, is losing uh, our planet. We also work with our Chinese colleagues with giant pandas. Uh, that is a, also a quite exciting species. It has a very interesting way how it produces babies because the embryo is lying in the uterus for quite a long time, which nobody understands uh, how that is functioned. So you see there's still a lot of things to do for you when you grow up as researcher and working in this field. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. And next we have Paula Hohumbu. Um, hi, everyone. I'm in Kenya. I'm in the land of giants, these phenomenal animals, elephants, rhinos, lions, giraffes, hippos, buffaloes. And I run an organization called Wildlife Direct. Our organization seeks to connect people to nature so that they will treasure it and act to save it. And today, uh, Kenyans watched the last animals for the first time. And it might surprise people around the world to know that wildlife documentaries made in Africa, which is uh, a massive industry, are rarely seen by Africans. And so many of our species are going extinct because local people don't actually know that much about these animals. And so my organization is committed to uh, raising the level of knowledge uh, and information about animals and our environment. We produce our own wildlife documentary series called Wildlife Warriors because what we want to see is an army or a movement of Africans who are the next champions to save these species from extinction. Um, we also work in the courtrooms and we work very closely with another panelist on this group on fighting wildlife crime. So we work to make sure that criminals get arrested, especially the people who are trafficking in products like ivory, rhino horn, pangolin scales, timber, which are taken from all across Africa, moved through our countries and sold into other countries half a world away. We want to stop this business because it's a multinational business. Young people all over the world have a very vital role to play because you can influence other people. Your voices really matter. So I hope that you'll join us in this fight. And last but not least, we have the Sherlock Holmes of the illegal wildlife trade, Sam Wasser. Hello, happy to be here. Happy Earth Day to you all. I'm the director of the Center for Conservation Biology at the University of Washington, and we work on tracking the illegal ivory trade as well as um, tracking the illegal pangolin trade and the timber trade. Uh, we use DNA to do this, and believe it or not, the whole thing started with elephant poop. We were able to use dung samples from elephants collected across Africa and get DNA from those samples so we can tell populations apart. And when there are large seizures of ivory made by law enforcement, we take DNA samples from those tusks and we match them to our DNA reference map made from poop. And we can tell exactly where the ivory was poached. And we can see from that where Africa's major poaching hotspots are, where most elephants are being killed. And then we are also able to link multiple seizures of ivory to the same ivory trafficker. And in doing that, we were able to do two really important things. First, we identified the two largest hotspots of poaching in Africa. And then more recently, we developed, the th we, we were able to identify the three largest ivory traffickers exporting large volumes of ivory out of the continent. Thank you so much and welcome to all of you. I was so fortunate to have such an incredible panel. Um, and I think we will start with you, Kate, because you used to be a war journalist. And then there is a segue between your war journalism where you became, you began to investigate the illegal wildlife trade. And in a way, they're really different paths, but I know there are many, many similarities between them. And I'm wondering what led you to be so concerned about the illegal wildlife trade that you decided to make a film about it? 
Well, I must say that I have always loved um, animals and they've been a huge part of my life. When I was a child, I wanted to be a veterinarian. But when um, in my late teens, I discovered a passion for photography and I'm a very curious person. Um, I can't ever stop asking questions and trying to get to the bottom of things. Mm. After working for many years as a photographer, um, specifically focusing on the Middle East and Afghanistan, I was went to Kenya for the first time, and it was right after I had been in Afghanistan, um, embedded with the U.S. military for work I was doing for the Wall Street Journal. And that particular assignment was very difficult. I witnessed a lot of horrible things that happen in war. And when I got to Kenya... I was really struggling with everything I had just seen and um, a very old friend of mine took me to the Maasai Mara and it was the sight of a herd of elephants in the wild that reminded me that there was still some natural order on this planet in spite of all the human destruction and that was so healing and I think is the difference between me having been able to recover from those horrendous experiences and not. And ever since, I've wanted to give that back and help elephants and wildlife in the way that they help me. Yeah, and it's incredible. The film is incredible if you haven't watched it. Um, I know some of you have. And the film, The Last Animals, focuses a lot on the northern white rhinos. And Thomas, I know that you've done a lot of work you, you've done. You've um, had the same objective as Kate as repopulating the species, but you have a very different approach. You're using science. Can you explain a bit about how you're doing that? Yeah, uh, my team and I uh, we trying to uh, develop the newest technology, mainly coming from regenerative medicine, uh, and to implement that into conservation. Because the situation is actually quite disastrous. We have only two infertile females left from this northern white rhino, um, which is a more than two-ton heavy rhino, which is actually the biggest rhino on our planet. And the number, number went down dramatically due to poaching. And Kate uh, described that very nicely in her, in her documentary. And I think uh, it is uh, man-driven that the rhino uh, is... is getting extinct from the planet. So we should use all the science we have in our hand to stop that and reverse this process. We use stem cell technology, advanced assisted reproduction, like it is used in human to make test tube babies. And uh, the, the motivation for that is actually um, quite, uh, quite relevant uh, because everyone is exposed to COVID-19 right now. And this is a habitat-borne disease, a disease which comes from animals, which come from a disturbed uh, environment. And we have other diseases like that. We have uh, Ebola, we have HIV, we had pests in the beginning of, of the mid-age. Uh, so there are a lot of diseases coming from uh, habitats, ecosystem, which are disturbed by man. And uh, if we don't fix them, then even more severe diseases will be uh, present in uh, our time. So I think it is really important to use sign to do something to fix what was done in the past. And we have the great hope that the young generation, people like you, Bella, uh, will not make the same mistake. And we see this development uh, like Greta Tunda, that this is a much more responsible uh, way of thinking to utilize the resources of our planet. Yeah, and talking about that, changing the mentality, obviously that's key because we can repopulate this, the northern white rhinos, but if the mentality remains the same, then they'll be destroyed again by human action. So, Paula, I know you've thought a lot about changing mentalities of people on the ground, of people in different countries. How do we go about doing that? Well, behaviour change is something that uh, I guess is a, a really huge challenge because... Sometimes people say, well, it's about knowledge, it's about information, so let's make sure everyone is educated. But we all know that smoking is bad for your health or exercise is good for your health. Not everybody does the right thing for their health, even though they know it. And so we have to find um, very powerful ways 
of convincing people that they should change their behavior. And, you know, in Africa, we have these amazing animals, elephants and rhinos. And to Africans, these animals are part of our culture. They're part of our history. They're part of our identity. In the Maasai people, they believe that elephants are actually the spirits of humans. That we came from elephants. And so killing an elephant is, is something you wouldn't even dream of doing. But if you go half a world away to China, uh, they only know an elephant in the form of ivory. And it's carved into some beautiful little thing. It may be, it's a Buddha, it's a religious symbol. Maybe it's a crucifix if you go to the Philippines. And so their, their interest in these animals is completely different. And if you tell somebody your religion is wrong, you shouldn't be using ivory crucifixes, it'll be a very difficult challenge or a very difficult explanation. And when you look at rhino horn, people are using rhino horns because they believe that if you grind it up and eat it, it will cure you of a disease like cancer or, or other diseases. So how do you tell people it's not actually going to work? Because they're not thinking about the animal that just got its horn chopped off while it was suffering on the ground half a world away in Africa. They're thinking about their sick child and they want them to be cured and they think, well, maybe this will work even if it costs a lot of money. This is really, really difficult. In Kenya, what we're doing is we work in classrooms with children and we take them films, we take them activities, and then we take children out of the classroom into the wild for expeditions for a whole week. We teach them about nature. We let them discover and explore by themselves. We let them meet their role models, people who, who they really admire. And we believe that by doing so, we're, we're passing on information. But we also introduce them to the elders in the communities so that they can tell our children about their ancient knowledge. You know, there is all this knowledge that has never been captured in our science books, but it reveals that we have a relationship with nature, with our animals, that is almost mystical, it's kind of magical. And it's unique to us, it's special. And I think that this is how we can change people's hearts and minds. It's about reconnecting to our environment, to our animals, and having pride in them. And it needs to be global. It can't just be in Kenya, because our animals cross international borders. And it can't just be in Africa, because our animals are being used in other parts of the world. So we need a global movement. We need everyone to be part of this for change to actually happen. Mm. And you, you've talked about changing hearts and minds, but it seems like there are some hearts and minds which are more difficult to change. And Sam, I know you've, I called you the Sherlock Holmes of the illegal wildlife trade because you've worked to bring down some of the most dangerous, biggest criminals in the industry. So how do you use the data you collect to do it? What's the process? Well, one thing that's very important, we've all heard about mutations that occur naturally in in the wild and those mutations tend to accumulate between populations and and the farther apart populations are the more genetically distinct they become from those mutations so we capitalize on that by creating a dna reference map and we actually use elephant dung or poop to do that because it's the most easy to find material from the animal and because we can get dna from that that allows us to essentially show how distinct these populations are. We then take, uh, when there's a large ivory seizure, so there may be a thousand tusks in there, we develop a way to subsample those tusks. And one of the first things we do is we identify the pair of tusks, the two tusks from the same elephant, and we put one aside so we don't analyze the same animal twice. And then we take about 200 samples out of a seizure that may be consist of, of a thousand or more tusks. We get the same DNA from each of those tusks and we match it to our DNA reference map. And that tells us where this large volume of ivory was actually poached. The next thing that happens is that we've learned over time that the ivory that's poached is almost always shipped out of a different country from where it's been poached. And these middlemen come and buy ivory from the poachers and move it up to the country for where it's consolidated and exported. And one of the things that we found when we are looking for the two tusks from the same elephant is that often there's only one of the two tusks present in an ivory seizure. 
And we wondered, well, what happened to the other tusk? Because we had genotyped the ivory in all these different seizures, we could look to see if the ivory, the two tusks from the same elephant, end up in different shipments. So when I say a seizure of ivory, I mean a shipment of ivory, not an ivory having an epile epileptic attack. <laughs> so we go and we find the two tusks that are in separate shipments. And what we found is that in many cases, these tusks do get separated. And whenever they are found between different shipments of ivory, those two shipments always left Africa from the same port. They always left close in time. And the ivory in those shipments often came from the same place. All of this suggests that the same trafficker actually moved both of those shipments of ivory. So by connecting the dots from all these different linked seizures that we were able to match that way, we've been able to identify how many big traffickers there are, as well as how connected the traffickers are across Africa. Thanks so much. Um, and I was uh, re-watching the film actually, and I, I was reminded of one of the most heart-wrenching scenes, which is, uh, Sam, when you're um, in the large shed with Kate and you're looking at the abundance of tusks, many of them from baby elephants. And um, we have a question from Emma Judd from the Haberdashers Abraham Darby School. And I think it's relevant to this because when you think about baby elephants and herds of elephants um, being destroyed by humans, you think it's all that many people would speak about because it's so important that we combat it. And her question is, why is it that we see so much about climate change in the news, but not much about the tragic extinction of animals across the world? Why is it that extinction is only reported once the species is gone? So that's an open question to the whole panel. Does anybody have any ideas? Thomas, how about? Um, yeah. I think you're a great person to speak to this. <laughs> yeah, it is quite a phenomenon. And I'm very happy that this question came up because climate change is a dramatic event on our planet. But the disastrous effect of climate change at least for the for the whole uh, community of animals, is uh, not comparable to what we see right now with the decline uh, due to poaching and uh, habitat destruction. And uh, we call it bioservice, animals which actually uh, provide clean water, fertile soil, uh, clean air. All these bioservice is a very important element of our life, of the integrity of our planet. And uh, this is totally underestimated. I give you an example. I have a picture of a very ugly animal with me. It's a naked mole rat. Uh, that is an animal uh, which is free of cancer. It lives more than 30 years, and it represents uh, what we lose if we don't care about species, uh, because this animal has a mystery to fight cancer, which uh, a lot of people die uh, every day uh, on this uh, disease. And uh, biodiversity evolution gives us an answer uh, which we don't uh, can, uh, can uh, find because we destroy uh, the planet in such a way uh, uh, which is absolutely uh, irresponsible. And so I think it is very important that the, the that the question why uh, the loss of species is so underestimated should be asked much more often, should be asked to decision maker in the UN. Uh, and uh, the climate change is a very dramatic event, but it is not, has not such comparable uh, effect like the loss of species. So we've spoken a bit about the destruction and the devastation um, that you highlighted there, Thomas. And Kate, I think this one is for you, from Keris Cowley, who's being homeschooled in Anglesey, Wales. Um, and she says, we saw the film and were really affected by what we saw. We would love to know what can we do to help as we live on Anglesey. So I guess for young people who perhaps aren't on the ground, who don't see the direct impact of the illegal wildlife trade, how can they help to combat it? Well, I would say, um, first of all, it's Earth Day today, but I think we are at a point where we need to think of Earth Day as being every day and um, not at one day a year, but we need to um, embrace our planet and think about all the all species on the planet every day in our actions. And what I would say is, well, first of all, we have um, 
prepared a number of uh, literacy, conservation literacy lessons that are going to be posted on um, Encounter EDU. And this, it may be silly for me to say one of the best things you could do is do your homework, but it's really, really important right now um, to for what we are calling conservation literacy to increase. And so um, we really hope to expand this across the planet so there is understanding of what the IUCN red list is, for example, what is CITES and what are the different, you know, um, appendix li lists mean. And so that as young people move into you know, the professional sector, that they have a basic understanding or a deep understanding of what's happening so that they can act more readily. And because ultimately your generation is going to be is inheriting this planet from us and these problems unfortunately are going to have to be carried on and tackled by by your generation so i would say that and there are lots of petitions um all over the place and a lot of a lot of times um you know they don't necessarily require that you be legally an adult um and i would say sign as many petitions if you can to protect wildlife species um they make a difference they really really do and um that would be my advice and find small ways every day in your life to do something uh, for your local your local community, whether that's reducing the amount of plastic you use or um, really sort of embracing, you know, recycling in a way maybe that you haven't, but it's walking more and using your car less. There are many, many ways in very like simple ways, but meaningful ways that you can make a difference. Thanks so much, Kate. And we have some live questions coming in now. Um, one of them is from a vet student in the UK. And she says, I know this isn't about the illegal wildlife trade, but I wonder what the panel's thoughts are on trophy hunting. So I guess all of you, um, because the illegal wildlife trade and trophy hunting are similar in many aspects, I guess all of you have um, worked on that in some areas. So uh, Sam, do you want to speak about your thoughts on trophy hunting? Yes, I'd be happy to. You know, historically, trophy hunting was a very important element of conservation because um, it was hunters were operating in very remote areas, and often the guides that were were taking them around were trying hard to preserve the wildlife in those areas to make sure that there were animals to hunt. Um, one of the problems, though, that has happened over time is animal populations have gotten smaller and smaller due to poaching and illegal trade. And, and this has diminished the number of animals that can be legally hunted. And um, the other problem is that there has been corruption overlaying this issue. And in a lot of places, these hunters are still taking animals illegally, getting false permits. So the whole situation has become far more complicated. And really, now we're at the time where, where there are so many people on the planet and the hunter safeguarding these remote areas is far less important. And one of the things that has um, happened in countries is some of these places where you have these hunting blocks these areas where you've got um, these very wealthy people coming in to hunt these animals and very few people are able to go to those areas except the hunters. One of the things that has happened in a couple of places, for example, Southern Tanzania is a good example, where some of the biggest hunter block owners actually were facilitating poaching and resulted in massive mortalities of, of these elephants. So it's complicated. It's not that all hunting is bad. Personally, I, I could never bring myself to kill an elephant knowing how majestic and intelligent these animals are. Others feel differently, but you know, the, the ability to, to, um, to deal with the corruption element of, of the hunting is, has just really complicated matters. And frankly, I would prefer that hunting just stop. Mm -hmm. Paula, haven't you um, said in the past that development and conservation go hand in hand? Could you speak a bit about that? 
Um, sure. I think that if we talk about Africa in particular, it's the last continent that still has its vast array of megafauna, what we call the, the big animals, the elephants and the rhinos and the giraffes. And many other continents have lost their animals because they went on this race for development and in doing so destroyed a lot of their natural environment and most of the species went extinct or very tiny little populations were left. Africa is, development in Africa is beginning to really take off now. And people are very excited because Africa has remained as a very poor continent where people have uh, not benefited from the modern world as much as people maybe in England or in America. And so everybody wants to have a car, a TV, an iPhone, uh, you know, to be able to travel around the world. Of course, the aspirations of all Africans are, good, are the same as people anywhere. Um, but we have to, we are at a crossroads. We're literally at a crossroads. We have to make some choices. Do we agree to have uh, all this development at the cost of this natural beauty, which some people think is only appreciated by foreigners? Or do we develop in tandem with securing this incredible wildlife asset because it will play an important role in our future economy, but it also is a very vital part of our identity. And, and that's a really important, important element of stabilizing people, um, creating unity across the continent um, and providing benefits for many, many people. Um, I was just listening to Sam when he talked about the hunting and as an African, my, my perspective is different. Africans have never been hunters for the sake of hunting. It's never been a game. It's never been something you do for fun. It, if you hunted an animal, it was because you really didn't have any other alternative and you had to eat the animal. And the idea of hunting an animal for pleasure is missing from our culture. And so I would say that the whole world needs to stop and think about the impact of their culture being imported into Africa and the effect that it will have on our animals. If people came to England and said, well, it's our culture to eat cats and dogs, we should be allowed to because it's our culture and we're visiting, we want to eat cats and dogs. People in England would say, hell no, absolutely no way. You're not going to eat our cats and dogs. And, and I think that that's, uh, everybody would accept that. And the same thing should be true in Africa, where the cultures are to respect and revere and uh, in many ways have a spiritual relationship with animals and landscapes, rivers, even rivers are sacred, forests are sacred. These are things that the world should, should respect. And development should go hand in hand with that, or we will lose our identity. We'll just look like another Shanghai or another New York or another London, and we'll lose our unique identity that, that is um, so special. There is no other continent with animals like Africa. So, Paula, another one for you um, from Kerry Cowley again, who asks, is there a good organization that we can support as we found a few and not sure which one? That's a really great question. There are hundreds or thousands of great conservation organizations in Africa. And I know that sometimes it can be really hard to navigate and try and figure out which one is doing really good work. I personally love the conservation organizations that are made up by the communities themselves on the ground. So uh, for example, coronavirus has caused a lot of problems for conservation in Kenya because tourists are not able to come and so local people are not making much money. And so there are organizations that are saying, hey, donate some money and we will keep this land open for the wildebeest migration in the Maasai Mara, for example, or help us to look after these farmers who are saving a forest down at the coast. It's those community conservation projects that I think we should support first and foremost because they are the people at the grassroots, right at the front line of the conservation work. They are the people who stop poachers. They are the people who educate their children. They are the people who make sure that the whole community is working together to protect the environment. Um, and if anybody wants to know the names of organizations, you can come to me, but I'll just give you a suggestion of one organization. Well, apart from mine, Wildlife Direct, but there's a great organization called Nature Kenya. And Nature Kenya works with communities across the whole country and they do fantastic work. 
So I think that's a really brilliant note to end our audience questions on because that's a call to action that wherever you are in the world, you can have an impact and you can get involved in combating the illegal wildlife trade and the extinction of species more generally. Um, just to finish up, we're going to go to each of the panelists um, as a celebration of Earth Day, we're each going to give a short Earth message. So what would each of you say to this young generation watching who within the next few decades are going to be the ones protecting these animals you're protecting? Should we start with Kate? I would say embrace Earth Day as though it's every day. I hope that this panel and the this live lesson and the next live lesson and, and also the film will help you imagine how your dream career or dream profession could be used um, to help biodiversity and conservation, which might be something that you had never thought of um, previously. And please do your exercises that we've prepared for you and um, be strong and stay safe during this period of time. I, I know it's, I feel my, my heart goes out to all the children to, to, on the planet right now who are going, living through this pandemic. And, um, and I really hope that we never see anything like this in the future. Thomas, do you want to go next? Yeah, okay. First, uh, I'm really impressed by the interest um, of the young generation on, uh, on the development of our planet. And uh, I can tell you, when I grew up and uh, was uh, in your age, uh, there were a lot of other things relevant, but not uh, saving our planet and take care uh, about decisions which are made from established politicians. Uh, which uh, have a life expectancy maybe from 15, 20 years or less. And these people make making decisions which are not good for our planet. So it's really uh, the right time for the young generation to be an active part in uh, ruling our planet because that's the environment you have to live in. And I think uh, by this uh, forced loss of species, uh, we will lose uh, 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 the integrity of our planet. We will lose the bioservice of all these individuals which make our planet so beautiful. Uh, so I think it is really important to be actively uh, uh, performing uh, new, new, new policies like we already see uh, uh, in the way Greta Thunberg or Bella Lack uh, is uh, acting. And I think that is uh, very hopeful for all of us as established scientists, and we uh, fully support this development. Thank you so much, Thomas. And Sam, what would your message be? My message would be that we need to educate ourselves and speak up. And essentially, we need to be a Bella, because the work that you are doing is really a model for all young young people in this world. And we're so proud of, of you and what you are doing. People need to understand how interconnected the world is and how critical these the roles that different species play in this whole connectivity that create ecosystems. And understanding that helps us also appreciate what we do when we take a single species out of that link, it can cause things to completely unravel in ecosystems. The elephant is one of the best examples of that. It's the largest land animal in the world that eats so much food and so many other species depend on the critical disturbances that elephants make um, for creating their own habitat that these smaller species dependent on them live in. So understanding the dynamics of, of what makes ecosystems healthy and whole and how it serves the planet and being being ready and willing to speak up like you do, Bella, is really the, the best thing we can do to save our planet in the future. Thank you so much. And um, Paula, what would your message be? Well, I'm, I've been so impressed uh, with, with all the ideas so far. I would say, um, learning about these animals and loving them must be first. We've got to love these animals. And if we love them, we will work to save them. And I think young people must 
know that they totally underestimate their power. As um, Sam said, you know, you guys have phenomenal power and it comes not just from the fact that you have access to more information than any generation before you ever had, but you have the access to technology that allows you to make a difference that wasn't ever possible before. Bella, you can talk to somebody in Kenya in a way that couldn't have happened 10 years ago. Um, so I would say every young person out there who's watching is watching because they care. Make a commitment, number one. Make a commitment to make a difference. Choose one thing that you're going to do. Follow through to do it and get your friends to help you. Because on your own, you can go so far. But when you're with a whole bunch of people, you can make a huge difference. Sometimes all it is is writing a bunch of letters to your member of parliament to cause them to know that you care about an issue and ask them to change the way things are done. The, the power and the influence that you can have uh, is phenomenal. It's just a matter of making that commitment and then following through. So we have four really powerful, inspiring messages. And um, just before we go, I want to say that I know we've heard a lot about rhinos and elephants and pangolins today, but wherever you are in the world, all the species around you are significant, as Sam said, and have a role to play in the tapestry of life in biodiversity. So everyone watching also has a role to play. Just as every species is significant, every individual is, and every individual is significant. And what better day than Earth Day, than the 50th anniversary of Earth Day to take a stand and to begin to protect our planet. So thank you all so much for joining and thank you to our amazing panelists. Uh, just before we go, Kate's going to introduce a video to you. Thank you so much, Bella, and thank you everyone for participating. I hope that everybody's been very, very inspired. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to um, acknowledge Sarasota Military Academy and the INSPIRE project. Today's Earth Day lessons uh, were born out of the fact that I was supposed to be speaking there today for Earth Day. And in February, uh, when COVID-19 started infecting the world, um, Todd Brown and I had a conversation and I said, you know, I think it would be totally tragic for us to have to cancel our Earth Day event. And rather than canceling our Earth Day event, Let's make it bigger. Let's make it virtual. Let's open this up to students everywhere. And I wanted to, I think that what Sarasota Military Academy is doing in terms of education is, is really um, inspiring. And for years, they have been, the kids there on Project Earth Day have been learning about pandemics. And there was this video that was they put together some time ago, and I just thought it would be interesting to share with everybody who is tuned in. So, thanks. Four years ago, we decided to have a public health unit in looking at how the government and different organizations, the military, and even the media that gets involved when something like this were to occur. It was right uh, on the cusp of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. It was very prevalent in the media. And we thought, you know what, why don't we do something in the schools because we're getting so many questions from the kids about it. So we decided to elevate the lesson and move into this experiential learning situation where the kids not only learn about it, but they actually get to have almost like a live action adventure game and trying to solve the puzzle. We can start to see patterns in how people behave, how they sometimes cooperate, how they sometimes work against each other in different ways. I mean, how it's the chaotic environment of an outbreak. I'm patient zero and I'm infecting everyone right now. It's a secret. Can't tell anyone. But I, ultimately, I, I think the students have always impressed me year after year with how diligent they are, how much they respond, and everyone working together to try to help the individuals infected and the community at large while they try to find a cure. First year, the survival rate was about 25%. The following year, I think two people out of 200. So it was not a good year. Last year was the first class that actually would consider a win. And they was at 51%. They barely made it. So we're hoping that this year will be better. 
Dr. Brown really stepped up the game of the simulation by adding the economy and students having to kind of buy food, for example, to, 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 keep, to keep themselves alive, but at the same time they have to avoid getting infected. So all of this complexity will make it super interesting to see, to, to watch it unfold. Dr. Sabetti is literally one of the greatest human beings that ever lived. So I emailed Dr. Sabetti, she emails me back, which is amazing in itself. Before we know it, we're having discussions by email. I asked her if she would be willing to Skype with our school, and then we put this together, and then I send everything to her and show her kind of what we did, and she says, oh my gosh, I want to be involved in this. Uh, and then she's really taken a leadership role, which is amazing for a middle school, you know, thousands of miles away from Harvard. But she's taken this leadership role, and as you know, she's on campus, and she's really involved in the entire layout of the outbreak itself. I am a computational geneticist. I run a lab of about 40 folks. Um, that are all working towards developing tools to help us in human health, particularly in responses to outbreaks. Last year we implemented the mobile app for the first time so that we could actually spread a virus over phones. And then we, this year we are, we're adding beacons, beacons that can show sort of hotspots of infection or vaccinations, uh, just ways of essentially signaling different turns that are happening in the outbreak. We also wanted to make sure that we could replicate what's really going on during an outbreak. We wanted to make this experience very engaging for students, to, that, so they feel that there is a real danger to it. So the actual rate of kind of, of recovery is not that high. So it is a very dangerous disease, in fact. 